Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that those words are so true. We thank you, Father, that the only reason and the purpose for us being here today is because you save, because you transform lives. As we look into your word this morning, Father, we're going to see how this all came about. We're going to see the reason why it was it was so needed for you to come and to save, Father. When you began this world in perfection, what went wrong? What happened, Lord? We're going to find out this morning in the weeks ahead, Father, this battle that took place in the stars, Lord God, ended up on planet Earth and caused the destruction of mankind. But because you saved, Lord God, it wasn't the end for us. In fact, in fact, from eternity past, you had it planned at the beginning. Help us to see this clearly, God. We need your wisdom. We need the Holy Spirit's discernment right now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We began the creation account last week in some detail by first looking at the prologue. So if you want to take your Bibles and open this morning to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Now, I gave you some passages earlier to put bookmarks in um, because we're going to be looking around a little bit here this morning. So I won't feel intimidated if I just move quickly through this because I'm going to assume that you already have your bookmarks in there as we open these passages. But we began by looking at the prologue. Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning, in the beginning. Now, this is not the beginning of eternity. This is the beginning of the material, physical realm. It's not the beginning of eternity. There is no beginning of eternity. Eternity always is. This is the real beginning of a physical time, space, universe, and our world, Earth. God, the Eternal One, who always is, created a time-space world in a formless fashion. Verse 2, it was formless. Now, we talked about this last week. It didn't become formless. And there are those well-meaning Christians who want to translate that simple little verb tohu as become rather than was. And it becomes critical because there are those those, those sincere-minded Christians who believe that science has proven that the world is millions and billions of years old. But they maintain a high integrity of the Bible. And because they do, they just, they just don't even stop to think, maybe the scientists are wrong, maybe they're reading the fossils wrong. That can't possibly be. They're scientists. So therefore, there's something wrong with the text. So we've got to find some way to maintain the integrity of the text so they try to find that. We talked about this a little bit last week, the gap theory between verses 1 and verses 2. In verse 1, God brought everything into being, but it became formless. And it's that time in that gap where, you've, where they want to insert millions and billions of years, where the dinosaurs lived and, and where pre-Adamic beings lived and there were volcanic activity and things like that. But it's simply not what the word means. It was in a formless fashion in order for it to become a flourishing planet, to become a complete planet. Now that pattern should sound a little familiar to us. It does to me. Because this is his project. It's God's project for taking incomplete things and making them complete in a sinful world. First thing we want to look up on the screen here this morning. He took this project of a formless earth and he turned it into a paradise. He takes us as formless, incomplete sinners and he turns us into flourishing saints, or at least that's what he wants to do. We know the end result of all of this. We know the end result of this whole creation account here. We know this because when you, by the time you get to verse 31 of chapter 1 and on into chapter 2, he goes from creation to completion, and we find that it's all perfect. It's all very good, and it's all very good because God can't do anything that is not very good. It is not of his essence, of his nature, to do anything imperfectly. And in verse 2, there are three words. We're going to spend time looking at these three words as we hop around some of the scripture this morning. But there are three words which describe all this in verse 2 uh, in, in regards to this yet-to-be-completed world. He uses the words darkness, formless, and void. Because it's here that we're going to be told how this all came to completion. Let's pick the story up in verse 3. Now, we're going to read quickly through these verses because I want to get through the entire chapter and the account that's taking place. So I'm going to read through quickly. Verse 3, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and, and God separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. 
So the first thing that God does on day one is to fill up darkness with light. Now sometimes we, we say this incorrectly when we talk about how the light drives away darkness. I use the same phrase, and when we use that phrase, we know what we really mean. But just, just to be technical here, there's no such thing as driving away darkness. Darkness is not a thing. Light is a thing. It's a created thing. The only reason why there is darkness is when there's an absence of light. So there was darkness, and what God did is he filled it up with light. Now, I'm not trying to over-spiritualize this, but is this not exactly what Jesus does to a life in sin? Again, let's look up on the screen. The key thought that we're getting here as we go through chapter 1 are the mechanics. The mechanics are revealed in how God does all of this, how he brought all of this into being. And we are told, the mechanics are, that he said, he spoke, and it was so. Now that word he said there, it's a word that means to bring something about. It means to be in full control as the speaker. These are the divine mechanics of how all things came into being. He spoke, and it was so. To be in full control as the speaker. Now I want to tell you that I have tried that many times as a father. I've tried to be in full control when I would speak things. And I guarantee you, if you're a dad, you've done the same thing. And, and, and moms do it too, but I think dads do it more often. And your parents probably did it to you and their parents to them and their parents. This goes all the way back to Adam. I've tried to be in full control. I'd say, look, when I get home, I, used to, I heard this a hundred times as a kid growing up. My dad would say, when I get home, I want that grass cut. And I'd say the same thing to my own kids with other chores. And so he would drive off to work and expecting the grass to be cut. Why? Because he said, and it should be so. Right? Have you ever done that with your kids? Jeremy's really shaking his head back there. <laughs> See, this very instantaneous act of creation... This was well accepted by all the authors of the Bible who spoke on this, also led by the Holy Spirit to affirm it all. Let's look at our first passage. Turn to Psalm 33. Psalm 33. I know you'll have your bookmark there. In Psalm 33, the psalmist, he looked at creation as a project of abrupt beginnings and not a process of long ages. Let's just look at a part of this. Psalm 33, verse 6. He says, by the word... Of the Lord. Same thing as saying that he spoke. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all of their host. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps and storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Why? Why should we stand in awe? Because of verse 9, because he spoke, and it was done. And he commanded, and it stood fast. The Hebrew writer, you don't have to turn there, but the Hebrew writer in Hebrews 11.3 actually deepens this very picture right there. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews 11.3 says this, just listen to these words. He says, by faith, we understand that the worlds, he's talking about the universe, by faith we understand that the worlds were made by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. So it's by faith we understand all the universe was made because God spoke them into being and he didn't make them out of something else that was already visible. Now the writer there in Hebrews, he's, he's no slouch to his understanding of how things work. This is deeply philosophical on his part and it's right. What he's saying is that there was no pre-existing material that was out there that God used to make the universe. Nothing was out there that existed alongside of God in eternity past, where God was kind of there one day and he says to himself, you know, I think I'm going to make a universe, and I think I'm going to create people, and you know what, I think I'm going to use, uh, let me see, a little bit of that, and I'm going to take some of that there, and oh, this would be awesome for making the Milky Way. He didn't do that. There was nothing there. That word, the, 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 this whole idea here, would require some other thing to have the same essence of eternity as God. It would require something else to have the same essence of eternalness as God does, and that's not possible. God is the essence of existence. 
There is just existence. There's no parallel universes. There are no multiverses or any of those kind of things that modern scientists like to come up with. It's impossible for that to exist. There's just existence. Now, there's many levels to existence. There's the angelic realm. There's the physical material realm. There's the spiritual realm. But there is just existence. But understand now, the writer's appeal here to faith in Hebrews 11.3, that's not the writer's attempt to remove facts or evidence or proof that God created. He's not just saying to us as readers, oh, just take it by faith. We don't need science. The science of origins, which we of all people as Christians should accept, is all premised on one philosophical reality. And the philosophical reality is this. Either all things came into being by creation or chance. There are not many options. There's only two. Either all things came into being by creation or chance. The Hebrew writer is affirming that first option. That all things came into creation. All things came into being by creation and not by chance. And the reason why he affirms this one and not this one is because this second one is impossible. Now, again, we're going to talk about a lot of the stuff as the weeks and months go by because a lot of things will dovetail for us here. But let's just take a moment and use this example, evolution. Now, evolution is a theory that is used by scientists to try to prove that all things came into being by chance, that we, that we didn't need God to bring all things or, or some being out there. We didn't need some being out there to bring all things into being. Now, evolution simply didn't happen. Evolution is not possible not only because we don't find any transitional fossils in the fossil record, and if evolution were true, there should be billions of examples of, the, of, of transitional fossils, meaning you know, fish becoming pigs or salamanders becoming dogs. We don't find that anywhere in the fossil record. We never observe it in the natural world. Evolution is not true not simply because of that. Evolution is not true simply because it violates the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics is just an undeniable law. It means that everything is winding down. Everything is becoming more and more disordered. For evolution to be true, the opposite has to happen. So it violates the second law of thermodynamics. But it's impossible because you cannot bring something into being from nothing. From nothing... Nothing comes. God was there, always. Why? Because he has the essence of foreverness. He has the essence of existence. So in completing this world, God spoke light into existence, and it filled the darkness. And as we said, if you remember, this was all written. Genesis was written. The first five books were written during the wilderness wanderings. So obviously the, the events of Genesis took place before the nation of Israel. But the nation of Israel would be hearing these words for the very first time being written down by Moses as he's led by the Holy Spirit. And they would have vivid pictures of what this would all mean to them. How God redeemed them through light. Let me invite you now to go to Exodus chapter 10. Here's one example they would have here in Exodus chapter 10. This is the ninth plague upon Egypt. And it reads this in verse 21. Now the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt. Now look at this. Look how he, look at the commentary in this. Even a darkness which may be felt. Anybody ever experienced darkness like that? I don't mean just getting dark outside at night. But I mean pitch black. I, we experienced that. My wife and I experienced that when we were on our honeymoon. Part of what we did is we go to the, went to the Mammoth Caves in Tennessee. And we were there on a guided tour. There were about 40 of us in there. Now, of course, when you go in, it's all lit up and everything, but the tour guide says, I want to show you something here of how pitch black darkness can drive a person insane. Because he would relate these stories about how 100 years earlier when, when you know, people who went into caves to inspect them and stuff, you know, the science of cave um, dwelling and stuff like that just wasn't as sophisticated. And people would get lost and they would die and they would find them a week later and basically they would find them as though they had died of fright because their lights would go out, and it would be pitch black. He says, I want to give you an example of this. He goes, I'm going to shut the lights off for 60 seconds. Nobody talk. Shuts the lights off. It was, it was it instantly, it was so piercing. The darkness just kind of goes through you. A couple of people would giggle, and, he, and, the, and the park ranger would say, shh, I want everybody quiet for 60 seconds. 
and you would just stand there. You literally couldn't see this. It just drove right through your body. He turns the light on. Everybody goes, Phew. man, that 60 seconds seemed like five minutes. He goes, yeah, it does, because it was only 20 seconds that I turned the light off. Piercing darkness. In fact, he goes on. He explains this. So Moses stretched out his hand towards the sky, and there was thickness, thick, uh, thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the sons of Israel had light in their dwelling. Now that little portion right there sometimes gets overlooked. So can you imagine this wilderness generation, they would hear these words from Genesis chapter 1, and the connection is made, yeah, yeah, Egypt. We don't know how something like that could happen. Man, it was, it, was, it was like God filling our darkness with his light when the rest of the world was in darkness, we can see. Just like at that creation moment. Because this is our redeeming God. He delivers us through light. We know that, that as they marched to the Red Sea, there was the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. His light penetrates the formless, the hopeless, the uncertain times in our lives. And we're not making any kind of baseless connections here because even the New Testament writers saw the same application of creation in all of this. What God did in the physical world, he also does in the spiritual. Take your Bibles and I'll turn over to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, let's look at verse 6. Paul writes this, For our God who said, He's just quoting Genesis here. Our God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. If we read it right, if we interpret Genesis the way that God intends by way of our Christian worldviews, Paul is telling us that we see the face of Jesus. His glory shines through it all. You see why? We cannot unhitch the Old Testament from the New Testament as we mentioned that there are those well-meaning, godly Christian pastors who suggest that we should. That somehow the Old Testament just doesn't have a purpose and meaning for this church-age world. You can't unhitch it. To unhitch it, we damage the glory of Jesus. Again, look up on the screen. Do you believe that God can bring light to the hardest Deep, uh, darkest person that you know. I mean, do you really believe it? That person that you might know that is just so turned off to anything spiritual, do you really believe that God can bring light to that person? Because if you do, then your view of God is commendable. But if not, then it needs raising, as God did to Israel after so many centuries in captivity, crying out to God, well, this is what God did in day one. If you want to go all the way back now to Genesis chapter one. This is what God did in day one of the creation week. The days of creation as written are even more spectacular when we read them as written. Even here, skeptics and doubters try to minimize the text, this creation week text to reduce it to mean something else. In the church world, there are those who think that science, as I said a moment ago, has proven long ages, billions of years for the age of the earth. But Genesis, as written, clearly doesn't say this. So what they want to do is they want to know how can we make it say something else to fit with what they believe modern science has proven. Well, we talked about the gap theory. Then they came up with something called the day-age theory. They attempt to claim that the word day, which is the Hebrew word yom, and I point that out to you because it's a very, very common word in the Old Testament. They claim that the word yom can also mean an undetermined amount of time. Now for the day-age theorist, what they have to do is they now <clears throat> need to read into the text and not out from it. If you remember, I told you that there's a word that you should, should begin to, 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 to learn. It's the word perspicuity. I'm going to use it again here because you use perspicuity all the time. 
Perspicuity is the way that we read any text. We read out from a text, whether you're talking about the Bible, whether you're talking about a manual for your lawnmower, or whether you're talking about a cookie recipe. The first thing you need to know is just what is the text saying. That's called, theologically, it's called exegesis. We perform exegesis. We want to read out from the text. But what people who hold to the gap theory or the day age theory or many other heresies will do is they want to read into the text to make it say something because they believe millions of years existed because they believe, hey, the scientists proved it. Therefore, since the Bible doesn't teach it and they admit the Bible doesn't teach it, we've got to find a way to stick it in there somewhere. Well, the word yam can mean a long period of time, but it's almost never used that way. It's the context where and how the word is being used that determines its meaning. It's usage throughout the Old Testament. There's no other word that's more common. This is used thousands of times. It almost always means a 24-hour solar day unless the text specifically says otherwise. Well, here, when you read the accounts of the six days of creation, here the text repeatedly refers to the usage of a 24-hour day. In fact, it's how the Hebrew mind understood the word day or yom when they applied it to other things. For example, the Jewish festival of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. It's how they understood the Sabbath day of rest as given in Exodus chapter 20. In fact, Exodus chapter 20 is taken directly from the creation week here of 24-hour solar days. I created the, 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 wor the, the world in six days, and I rested on the seventh. Meaning the seventh day is the same day in duration as the others. It just has a different purpose in it. And, it's, and it's, it's the pattern that God looks to the nation of Israel and says, I want you to do the same thing. When we rest, in fact, we talked about this in Sunday school this morning. We don't rest on the Sabbath for a long period. We rest for a period of time a time that fits our normal activity of life as per anything else. So we find that God filled up darkness with light. Again, let's look up on the screen. The next key word from verse 2 is the word formless. Formlessness. Now you may have some notes in your Bible there that will say something like the words formless, void, darkness are words that indicate evil or a chaotic state. It's simply not true. Your notes are wrong. It's a word that means something that is just incomplete. See, God brings orderly harmony to this yet unformed world. If we go back to Genesis 1 in days 2 and 3, he brings division and distinctions like this. Let's pick it up, pick it up in verse 6. Again, I'm going to read quickly. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let, the wa let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning, a second day. So the writers now here, I mean, I mean the waters here now, are divided into parts. And this division is good when two or more separate benefits and purposes result from this. There's now waters which are on the earth and waters which are above the earth. Some people call that a vapor canopy, an intended divinely created greenhouse effect. Can you imagine that? We are doing everything in our society today to prevent a greenhouse effect, and God basically created a greenhouse effect and no carbon footprints. Both of those things, this vapor canopy and the waters on the earth, actually became deadly consequences in the fall of Adam and the eventual flooding of the world in Noah's day because those fountains of the deep exploded and the vapor canopy collapsed. Let's continue, verse 9. Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered in, into one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Now again, this beneficial division is partly called dry land. That's obviously good for us. And the waters are called seas. Now, the word seas here is just a general term for large bodies of waters. But if you think about Israel, what can Israel begin to see here in themselves? What do we see? We see that this mostly formless nation with no distinction, the only distinction they've ever had for 430 years now has been slavery. They have no purpose outside of themselves just being somebody else's commodity. They left Egypt as just a big mass of humanity. 
In fact, Exodus chapter 12 tells us that there was even an additional mixed multitude that came with them. There were Semites and even some Egyptians who went with them because they didn't want to serve under Pharaoh anymore. In fact, those Semites and Egyptians became a problem for Moses later on in life. But they leave here, millions of people, they have no form, no distinction. And so they plod their way to Midian, where Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, lives. And, Moses, and, and Jethro observes how disorganized and formless they are. And so what Jethro suggests is a leadership flowchart. And in all 40 years of their wandering, it wasn't until they possessed the promised land that they divided up formally into the names of their tribes. They were given new leadership, new blood in Joshua, and it would be Joshua's responsibility to mold them into an administrative and conquering people. So they learned from this creation account what God did in forming a universe and world. He can certainly do in a people because we serve a God who redeems. What does that mean to us here now in the church age? Well, one more time, let's turn over to the New Testament. If you have that passage in 2 Corinthians, if you still have a bookmark in there, flip back a few pages and go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. What does this mean to us in the church age? 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Paul writes to the church here and he says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Now, Paul has a list here because Paul is famous for writing lists. They're never meant to be endless, but he does use his lists. Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor vilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. And this list that Paul gives here is just to prove the point that redefining sin in order to call it something else is not the work of a righteous person. The unrighteous that he speaks of here in verse 9, who, who will not call sin, sin, as per his list, and you could add a lot of other things to this as well, if they, if, they, if they don't call sin, sin, if they don't repent, will not have any part in God's kingdom. And he reminds them in verse 11, some of you are engaged in this very thing, this kind of life, this formless life with no purpose, slavery to sin. But you were made pure. You were washed. That is, washed in Christ's blood, the only way that it can happen. You were sanctified. You, you were set apart to have purpose and design. You were justified. You were declared guiltless before God. Just the way that he did with this formless world, bringing order and purpose to it. Just the way that he did with a formless nation, brought order and purpose to them and saved them, redeemed them. He does with us. Why? Because our God redeems. He brings order out of disorder. Again, look up on the screen. This third word that he used here, God not only brought light where there wasn't any and harmony to a formless planet, he also turns this lifeless void here of Genesis into a thriving planet. So if we go back to Genesis here, Genesis chapter 1. From the middle of day 3 up through day 6, he fills this void with variated lights in varieties of life. Again, let's read quickly verse 11. Then God said, let the earth sprout forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed. Now notice the plural in all of this. Plants yielding seed after their kind and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning. A third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Now let's just stop there for a second. What's happening here is this whole idea of trying to track time was now possible based on the built-in natural mechanics of how this world functioned. At this time, remember, the world is still in a perfect state. 
But in our now fallen condition, this becomes even more crucial to us when it comes to things like agriculture and seasons and, and planting and harvesting. We need a way to be able to judge time, even as a practical living condition. You know, like, when is the cold season? You know, when is the rainy season? When's the warm season? When's flood season? When's hurricane season? I mean, think about the people in Florida and Puerto Rico, what they've just gone through. Every year they got to know, when is hurricane season? Because if it keeps changing on me, I'm never going to know when to prepare for it. He goes on, verse 20. Then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters. And you might have a different interpretation there. Every living creature that moves with which the waters swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the sea and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, a fifth day. So he fills the waters. Now, if you look at verse 20 there, this is a difficult passage to be able to interpret from Hebrew into the English. And English versions use lots of different words. They're all correct. But he fills the waters with teams and swarms of living creatures. You might have something like that. In the Hebrew... It literally reads, it's kind of an awkward translation in the Hebrew. Literally it reads, he fills them with swarms of swarms. We just don't talk like that. But the point here is, this is not just some blob plotting its way out of a primordial ooze. He's a God of abundant life. That phrase there he uses of, of great sea monsters. You might have a term like great whales, or that's okay too. But what's interesting, and again, we'll get into this as these things overlap in the weeks ahead, because we're going to have a question of when did dinosaurs come on the scene of human history? If the world didn't exist for millions and billions of years, and the Bible clearly says that it did not, especially with this, and you look at the genealogies, it simply did not. The world's been around for thousands of years, not millions of years. Where did dinosaurs come in? And if Genesis really is the beginning... Because Genesis clearly states, as Moses reaffirms, as Paul reaffirms, as Jesus reaffirms, there is no beginning before the beginning. There's just the beginning, and it's here. So where do dinosaurs fit? Well, they would have to fit in the beginning in one of the six days, and they come in, it seems like, on the sixth day when the great beasts are made. But we'll get back to that. But that term, great whales or great sea monsters, the Hebrew word is tannin, and that is most frequently used in the scriptures as interpreted as a dragon. And I remember during this time the word dinosaur wasn't the word that existed at that time. All small and large sea creatures that have ever lived in the, in the seas were made in great abundance, filling the seas everywhere, the birds filling the skies everywhere. Verse 24. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Again, let's look up on the screen. This here is the pinnacle of God's design. The place that he wanted to bring earth to as a thriving planet for us, for mankind. So that we could more fully see the glory of God. Everything, he el everything else that he did in beauty and abundance, he did for us, for mankind. Man is to rule over it all. This is reaffirmed. As the passage goes on, this, this was his goal, verse 28. God is just or, uh, Moses is just basically repeating what the Holy Spirit tells him to repeat here. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth, and every tree which has yield, uh, fruit yielding seed in it shall be food for you. So it seems, it appears... That all creatures, including us, were plant eaters, including lions and panthers and all the rest. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the sky and to everything that moves on the earth, which has life, I've given every green plant for food. And it was so, and God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, there was morning, the sixth day. So earth is now man's possession. It's our stewardship. 
so much so that the animal world is designed for complete subjection to him. In fact, this same mandate is restated after the flood of Noah. And if you remember, after the flood of Noah, sin has entered the world. Sin entered the world, that's why we had the flood of Noah, so this, this mandate had to be re-given in what it was now a, re, a, a depopulated world in sin. But that mandate is then modified to include fallen conditions like the fear and the terror of every creature will be in them. But here, we're still in its perfect state. It's man who has a natural and peaceful dominance. Three times, man is seen as the pinnacle of God's plan in creation. And this whole paradise is now sanctified and at rest. And this introduction closes his creation account with God's full righteous stamp of approval. We find in verse 2, the last thing we'll read, in chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their hosts. By the seventh day, God completed his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all of his work which God, uh, which, which God had created and which he had made. Okay, we'll pick up more of this as the weeks go ahead. What, what are some connections we can make here? When we as people, when we come to the book of Genesis, we cannot read Genesis. We can't really read any portion of Scripture. But because we're looking at Genesis, we cannot read Genesis with untainted eyes. It's very hard for us as limited, finite, and sinful people to grasp the full sensations of mind and heart and emotions and relationships and environment and anything else of what was happening here. We can read the words and we know what they mean but we also have a whole lot of other fleshly, sinful interference that causes us problems to try and go deeper. That's why we can't negotiate any of this away. All of the words and their meanings are so necessary to grasp the full text and message since we cannot experience it fully. We only experience it in part as, as sinners as save sinners who still groan in this life awaiting our full redemption. As Christians, we have a greater attachment to all of this, but we also realize that what we're experiencing now in, in our life after sin, in our life in the church age awaiting for his return, we realize that things are not complete yet. We are not in the state of Adam and Eve anymore, but we will be. But in the meantime here, we groan. See, just like Israel, so our view of God is lifted every time we read and we study these words and these events as real and accurate. Anything short of that will leave you in darkness. Let's stand together. Let's have our praise team come. Let's close in prayer. Our Father in God, we tried to tackle a lot here this morning because there's a lot that's in there. But when we read your account, Father, we, we read the words simply as they are. If you do speak the truth, Lord God, and we know that you do, then the words mean what they mean. You brought everything to, uh, into being at the beginning. And there was only one beginning, Father. And this here, what we find that you moved Moses to write from the book of Genesis is the only beginning that you give to us, God. And we realize, Father, that what you started, what you intended for us, was to walk and live and to move in harmony, perfect harmony with you. And you gave us all of the ability to do so, Lord, We made in your image, the breath of life within us that caused us to become a living soul so that we could freely choose to walk with you. But we know the end result. We're now some 6,000 years removed from this God. And we know the result is that we groan in agony of a life that is not perfect yet. We are perfect in Christ, but we still groan in this fleshly body, waiting to be made perfect when we come face to face to you. So, Father, in all of this, 
we ask for your divine guidance, your insight, Father, that we remain true to your word. If we remain true to the words and the events in this book here, then we will, we will remain true to the events that unfold afterwards and the truths like that of the gospel that come directly from what happened here in Genesis. If we lose sight of Genesis, we lose sight of the gospel, and we can't do that, God. There's so much of that in this world right now, Lord. We don't want to add to this. So, God, thank you for your word. Thank you that every time we come to it, we know that it is truthful, it is right, and it is correct. And it is us who needs to adjust our worldviews to it and not the other way around. Thank you, Father, for all that you've given to us. Help us to be the people who live in light in this dark world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.